My name is uh, Michael Schlossmacher. I'm at the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute uh, and I'm the uh, program director at the program for neuroscience at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and I work as a neurologist at the Ottawa Hospital too. So this actually goes back to 1996. I was doing my clinical uh, training as a neurologist in Boston at the time. Uh, and I'd previously trained scientifically uh, in Alzheimer's disease with a gentleman named Dr. Dennis Selko. And so I came to visit him uh, frequently to talk about the future and how I can get back into science. And I said, I don't want to go back into Alzheimer's disease. It's very well traveled and I don't want to focus on the same topic. I want to do something else. And I'm interested in movement disorders. And he told me uh, about a colleague of uh, Dr. Matt Farah at the time at the NIH, uh, Dr. Bob Nussbaum, Robert Nussbaum who had just given a presentation about his discovery of this nuclein gene and that mutations are linked to familial forms of Parkinson. And so Dennis said to me, why don't you keep an eye on that topic? Uh, and for a number of other reasons, I, I did and became more and more interested and then decided I'm going to do a combination of a clinical fellowship um, in Boston and with a little bit more scientific training. And then a number of other things happened, but I really loved uh, to shift um, my focus onto Parkinson's because also it was about 10 years behind of what some of the revolutionary changes that had happened in Alzheimer's. I initially started out working on um, genes that are linked to Parkinson's that Bob Nussbaum and people like Matt Farah put out there for us to follow the leads and uh, follow the, the trail so to speak. And then I realized I need to carve out a little bit of a niche and uh, start to work on biomarkers as, as you probably know there's not a lot of laboratory tests uh, that tell us this person has Parkinson's or he is pro or she is progressing at a certain rate. So we spent a fair amount of time on developing fluid-based, so spinal fluid or blood-based um, uh, biomarker assays. And that went pretty well and I helped train a person who is now doing a phenomenal job on this. Um, I realized that my own interpretation of what I actually, the way I see Parkinson's, I trained as an internist, I trained as a neurologist, so I have a slightly different perspective and I said, I really want to model this in, in animals. I've never been trained in animal models. So about 2013, I changed uh, focus almost completely in my laboratory. And now we're trying to uh, rebuild the complexity of Parkinson's uh, in animals, meaning that there's more than one factor that plays into to bring out the illness. And so what I hope to accomplish is that we model the different forms of Parkinson's that are out there. I think most neurologists don't understand that there's a variety of different ones, not just one. And number two, I hope that we will be able to make a contribution to unlocking the secrets of what some of these mechanisms are that where things go awry and then initiate the disease. Uh, and number three, I mean, my dream would be to actually bring something back to the patients and contribute in some fashion that will make a difference for them and uh, at the bedside in the clinic. And so that, that's what gets me out of bed. On a personal level, I'm extremely uh, grateful that uh, we received uh, funding support in the past uh, for students and uh, postdoctoral fellow. It's extremely competitive and you know that you're competing with um, better trained, uh, better educated, more successful people for funding. Uh, but in the three concrete ways, uh, funding from the Parkinson Society, from back then Parkinson Society Canada helped my team. One was I had a very gifted graduate student, the first one actually after I moved to Canada, and he was amazingly gifted. So he got a scholarship to uh, test a biological scissor. It's called an enzyme that chops down the bad play in Parkinson's, which we identify as alpha synuclein. And he did an amazing job. And uh, just as he started to write up his thesis, we submitted a grant to the Federal Canadian Institute of Health Research and got funding that actually went until this spring. So it made a big difference. And then the second thing, uh, as an example, is we were funded through a Porridge for Parkinson's res uh, fund research effort, uh, so fundraising effort that donated uh, $45,000 at the time to some drug screening. And uh, that went to my colleague, Dr. Juliana Tomlinson, and that was really helpful. We did this in primary nerve cells. And from that, we were able to take a next step uh, and uh, write uh, and, and finalize patents and uh, now teamed up with uh, Genzyme. And uh, it's a wonderful story for us is this came full circle that actually a phase two clinical trial is starting in 2016 uh, with uh, patents protected worldwide that uh, related to the work we did at that time. 
And so for me, it was um, a game changer because I realized sometimes it just takes a small step and the right idea connecting it with the right amount of seed money to get something rolling and not have to make a gigantic cell paper or nature paper contribution to actually move things forward potentially more effectively. So the funding through back then Parkinson Society Canada has been an amazing enabler, facilitator to get some of these seed monies to move things forward. When I think of Parkinson Canada now, I think of it in three different ways uh, and three different roles. Uh, one is that I think within Canada it represents uh, a voice of authority and uh, competence and uh, also a voice of integration for various efforts which patients need and so that it's a go-to agency for a variety of needs and therefore serves not just uh, a role for us but also for the community which is really important. Because of that it's also able to then speak up in front of Parliament for instance I um, was invited once with John Stossel and others to go and make the case that we should try to increase the funding. The second thing however is I think it is also playing potentially not a fully appreciated and could in the future play a bigger role in the education of gifted trainees. I think this notion of supporting fellowships for graduate students, um, of which there are many from Vancouver all the way to Quebec and Newfoundland, uh, there are very few funding mechanisms that are uh, really supporting disease-oriented research at the federal level in my opinion. And so I think the Parkinson Canada research team has a mandate in many ways and does this and could potentially increase this to really fund career development for young people that are passionate about neurodegenerative diseases and Parkinson's in particular. And the third role, as mentioned, is uh, it is often a pivotal idea, and so uh, a new investigator work, but more importantly, pilot projects are really important to get an idea that germinates in our heads and we are delusional all the time, think of this could work, this could work, and often things don't work, that, but have to be tested. And to be able to take that first step and um, hire a person or enable a person to stay long in the lab to test an idea is really, really important to then apply for a bigger grant. And I think that's, that continues to be an important role uh, for the Parkinson, for Parkinson Canada. One very early inspiration was um, one of my teachers in neuropharmacology, Dr. Ole Honikiewicz, who worked at the University of Toronto. He's turning 90 in uh, August, I think. And so he actually, there's going to be a big dopamine symposium in Vienna. And uh, I was honored to be invited to be one of his three birthday gala speakers. Um, but the amazing thing is he, in 1963, after having the idea and was the first one in the world to demonstrate that dopamine was missing in the brain of Parkinson's patients, with his colleague, uh, Dr. Birkmeier, gave the first application of uh, dopamine to a patient who hasn't moved and was bedridden. And that grainy footage, that video, I will never forget. And it's inspiration that a man with the right idea uh, in the right circumstances just made history. As exciting as it is, the embarrassing thing is that 53, 50 plus years later, uh, we haven't uh, really fundamentally moved things beyond, namely to do cause-directed therapy. So he's, he's a forever a source of inspiration. And then I was also tremendously privileged, and I often think of two men that I was allowed to care for as a neurologist. And one had a non-movement disorder, the other had a movement disorder. And the former one was uh, Joseph Murray, who won the Nobel Prize in 1992 for uh, making kidney transplantation happen. And uh, he told me the story how he came up with the ideas and, and how he had to fight and overcome adversity from the Catholic Church in Boston, the Archdiocese in Boston, the Vatican, the American Medical Association, everybody was against him and thought that he was a devil, he was evil because he played with organ transplantation. Uh, and uh, to hear him, who was a, he was a deeply religious man, uh, how he weathered the storm and had the stamina to just withstand that hatred and criticism for many, many years uh, was just absolutely amazing. And the second one, that um, in the same vein, this other gentleman that I fo uh, followed uh, for movement disorder, his name was Tom Emil Fry, and he uh, was an, on an oncologist, and he made history. He was the first one, together with a colleague in New York, to apply cocktail therapy so that you use more than one drug to treat uh, incurable childhood leukemia. And the children were dying like flies of this leukemia. There was just absolutely nothing that could be done. And all the research protocol that uh, Tom and his colleagues submitted 
were denied because they were felt to be too aggressive, too, uh, you know, too risky, uh, and too different from what the dogma said should be done for these children. And then he and his friend, against all odds, only with a tacit approvement of one department head, after the NIH said no, after the government of New York said no, federal government, they applied everywhere to give a chance, to get a chance to do this trial. And this would be undoable today. They just went ahead and did a small cocktail therapy trial with a tacit agreement of a department chair. And all of a sudden, only 40% of the children died in their first year. So he said, when he saw that I had to be doing the right thing for my patients, I knew that I, I can't be punished and I would be ready to go to jail. And then I said, but saying that is one thing, but what actually made you have the gumption to really move forward uh, because you faced serious risk? And he said, the mothers told us, do not worry. We want our children to survive, even if it's for another year. Uh, you have our consent, do it, because they're dying, right? And that was just so moving that he said he felt empowered by his patients, not just his young patients, but also by the families. And that sense of conviction to fight dogmas, to fight establishment, to not give up, to not surrender in the face of hardship is unbelievably uh, inspiring. And I see this often in, in our patients in the clinic. My first answer would be that uh, this is an incurable illness and it affects currently 100,000 plus uh, people in Canada. With increasing uh, numbers for aging members of our society, we face more people because aging is an extremely important risk factor for Parkinson's. So it's an obvious thing that as we want to prevent flu and want to cure pneumonia when it occurs, that we also want to diminish the, the new cases and also help cure ultimately people with Parkinson's. And we haven't done that yet. It's not a self-fulfilling prophecy for us researchers. This is a real need for society. Uh, number two, I think we have a great opportunity in Canada to uh, build on the momentum that exists. I think some of the clinicians and, and basic scientists uh, are really leaders in the world. And I usually tell my friends uh, an interesting story that in 2014 and 2015, I went to two uh, company meetings where I was asked to be a scientific advisor. So these were American companies. One was in New York City and the other one was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the scientific advisory board in this scenario is usually somewhere between six and 10 people that come and just uh, answer questions. And on both occasions, 50% of the people in the audience who came as advisors to American companies were Canadians or were people that worked in Canada for years. And it was just like, there's a population difference of 10 to one and yet 50% of us were Canadian. So it just exemplified that the heft of expertise and, and energy toward Parkinson's disease at the clinical level and the basic science level was excellent in Canada. And then I have a dream. Um, our current Prime Minister's father died of complications from Parkinson's, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And my dream would be that there's a Pierre Elliott Trudeau um, act in Parliament uh, to support neurodegenerative diseases akin to what the United States Senate had initiated with the Morris uh, Udall Centers, by which a separate arm of funding within the National Institutes of Health, and in our case, through government, would support uh, research centers. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you very much, all of you, for the tremendous support that uh, you have given to researchers like myself and clinicians um, through the Parkinson uh, Canada research effort. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful to feel that support, to be able to go to work and try to do something for you, to return the investment. Uh, and I just want to communicate to you not only my gratitude, but that from the bottom of my heart do I think that Parkinson disease is curable. It just means that we haven't asked the right questions and we haven't worked enough and long and hard enough, but uh, we're all in this to deliver for you. Thank you very much.